So to kick it off maybe with Neil, can you tell us a little bit about why Andrina is different and what looks different about it? Cool. Thanks for that, Mahesh. And Sal, thanks to you guys for organizing all this. So to give you guys a little bit of context about what we do, we are essentially a hybrid fiber and wireless internet service provider, and we build our own hardware and then take it to market to provide internet at both affordable rates and with unit economics that are just much cheaper than that of the incumbents. And we have typically found ourselves operating in being able to compete against you know, the folks of Verizon and Comcast and being able to offer our service at a, at a better experience. And over time, you know, we found ourselves building this really interesting wireless network across the Mid-Atlantic. We're now in eight states in the process of launching another eight to be, you know, we want to be all over the country by the end of 2024. So ultimately, you know, we, we built a system that has allowed us to realize some good revenues, about two and a half million in top line revenue, 19 million in contracted. So it's the kind of thing where we know that landlords really like the system that we're building. And as you guys have kind of seen from everything that you've got going on here, there's this really interesting kind of fusion between physical infrastructure and all of digital infrastructure as this combination of like cloud and telecom coming together. And our hope is as this sort of Web 2 business that is dabbling in the Web 2.5, Web 3 ecosystem, to really enable all of these different technologies to come about by partnering up with our existing landlords and clients to be able to deliver these types of systems on top of that. So to give you guys a good sense of that is that we were you know, right behind CalCHIP uh, during the genesis phase of the Helium 5G network, the second largest deployer of, of their gear on top of our network. Uh, you know, We were relatively late to the space in 2021 when we first started, but it's the kind of thing where we've seen interest from the Web2 sector, you know, TradFi, to really take these systems and find a way to bring them to this larger market and this larger ecosystem. So the overall hope with what we've been doing, just to reemphasize, is to have our Web2 business be a core catalyst to all of the Web3 initiatives. And as we're going towards doing our own Web3 product, it's a combination of using our IP to allow us other folks to really replicate that system that we've built all across the market. And so if I can kind of speak to you know this a little bit more, it really comes down to the parts that I find fascinating about all this whole stuff and where I think DPIN is uniquely suited towards is across the entire market, there really is an opportunity to get some non-speculative ROIC for all these folks in this entire sector. And if you can use that trend as a catalyst to drive additional business opportunities, that's where I think a lot of the really interesting technologies will begin to emerge because you can go to the retail market and say, guys, come use this new cool system. You're not gonna have to wait for this token to balloon to get your value. You're gonna get your return in capital in a very short and timely manner. And essentially, it's taking the unit economics that we have done as we compete against these incumbents and fractionalizing the cost that allows other people to participate in it. So I, I think, you know, as you kind of look at our business and you know, hopefully more, more that are kind of thinking about it this way, it's really gonna be riding this fusion of digital infrastructure across, across the entire last mile. And you know, what are all the cool projects that can be spun up on top of that? So hopefully it's a, a quick primer for you guys. That's awesome, Neil, thank you so much. And uh, look, as the space continues to blossom, I think one of the things that's really notable about what Neil's doing, and it's, it's an interesting approach to DY, to build out central capacity first, get a, get a fair amount of revenue, and then build the decentralized wireless network on the back of it to some degree. So Neil, if you could talk just a little bit about like what does revenue look like today? How are you actually going about building out? How does that grow and eventually how will you decentralize that? Yeah, so I mentioned you know where we're at from a top line perspective and that essentially comes down to the fact that we are going towards data centers and we're buying internet at incredibly high capacity. I mean, we're talking like 99 plus percent margin. And then we're using wireless and an excess fiber to really distribute it from that one location to another. And in the process of building those systems that make that really efficient, like a good example of what we equip our technicians with is a robotic antenna system. So they can go ahead and deploy this out of the roof and it'll automatically align to a data center. So the idea is you can get these fully end-to-end -end deployments where technicians don't even have to be specialized in the space to be able to deliver a really meaningful system. And the nature of what we have done as sort of this infrastructure as a service model, now we're gonna be bringing out to that broader market. So in a scenario where I don't have to recoup my internet investment, a good scenario is instead of paying you know, $140 for a gigabit internet, if you could bring your own infrastructure to the table and pay $10 for a gigabit internet, 
that's very much so the ecosystem that we want to work in. And so, you know, as I kind of alluded to before, what we're building is what we like to call decentralized autonomous wireless networks. And that really is a fusion between these wholesale resources that you'll find at data centers, automated wireless systems through robotics that we are building, and then bringing those to the market, and allowing consumers to be able to fund their own gear and get access to that same hyper cheap internet that we have. And you can imagine that you know the ultimate vision that I try to have is I want to turn internet into cloud and cloud into a household appliance, and I want to be able to drive that business case in a non-speculative fashion. Decentralized autonomous wireless network. John, not that. That's easy. With all the fighting around DPIN, DRUN, and all that. Yeah, maybe we go with Don with DY instead. Look, last thing, Neil. Any implications? Anything, any other takeaways that you want our audience to take away from this versus what the rest of DY might look like in terms of what you guys are really doing differently, you think? Yeah, I'd say keeping in mind, you know, as we, I can speak a little bit more to the DY side of stuff, and you know, that's why I'm huge fans of like what XNet and Carrier One are doing, is they really are speaking to a very important trend that I think we need to be always very aware of, is what is the regulatory environment from a spectrum perspective, and what are the different cost curves that we're finding in technology. Like the future where CBRS is gonna be approaching the price of Wi-Fi is imminent. You know, these are these kind of macro trends that I think we all need to be really aware of to understand how are these chips becoming commoditized and driving the price down? How does software-defined radio lead to a more agnostic future across all spectrums? And then being able to build these systems that are anticipating these, obviously, so that you can bring them to these markets and stay flexible and future-proof. So I think that's really one of the, the real risk factors that we have as we approach DPIN, is just hardware cycles. But luckily, there are a lot of different software initiatives like SDR that are going to be making hardware cycles a lot more long time, long term in terms of the horizon. There makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Neil. So, for the next hour or so, we're going to switch to something a little bit different from what you've been seeing so far. You've heard a lot of really strong founder perspectives. We're going to hear some investor perspectives as well, because at the end of the day, it's a tough market. And we want to make sure y'all y'all really understand everything and everything else that's going out there. So maybe we'll move to Ani for a sec. Honey, what's Dragonfly up to? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, um, I think a lot's changed uh, in the past year or two. I think when we started Dragonfly in 2018, uh, one of the main ideas we were thinking about is the demographic situation, especially in the West, wasn't ideal, right? I mean, if you look at just the growth in populations in Asia and everywhere else, it was very clear that somebody needed to do crypto investing properly uh, for the rest of the world, so to speak. And so you can say that. Um, like we are driving by like backing highly technical founders in emerging markets, so it's almost like emerging market squared, right? Where it's like things that we don't know um, work in places that we don't really back then we didn't really know how to operate in, and now we kind of invest globally. And um, you know, we've been doing a lot of growth investing in the past few months, past few years, and I think that's kind of very unique for a crypto native firm, especially at this point, given all the crises of last year, especially. But no, we've been sinking our toes into uh, deep end quite a bit over the past few months. Um, and you know, we let the last year around, but I'm super excited to see the explosive high octane growth of like all these companies, especially the ones that represent in this room. I think it's very exciting to see. Awesome. Uh, anything in particular about the approach you guys are taking towards deep and in particular drug supply that you might want to share with the crowd here? Yeah, I would say for the most part, one thing we go very deep into is consumer choice. I think consumer choice has been one of the most impactful revolutions probably over the past 50, 100 years. I mean, if you look at the modern contemporary world, a lot of that has just been revolutionized by consumer choice. And I think there are a lot of metrics that track that. In the case of Andrino, when uh, we were talking to Neil, it was very clear that this was a founder and a team that I think deeply understood that the values that people really want, you know, competing over a better, faster, more intensive technology was something that Andrino was top tier at. And we really look for that in deep end projects. I think if you're just trying to compete head to head with AWS, you know, we're seeing that all the time, or if you look at decentralized compute, I mean, you can't just like copy uh, what any of the big incumbents are doing, right? You have to figure out like new modalities in which you can actually drop costs, make a way better product. And uh, even as a joke, I don't know, I uh, almost tell you that, you know, when we first met, I thought they were kind of doing like uh, the Tesla broadband in some case, because before Andrina, I'd never really heard of anyone like talk about, you know, like internet stuff at parties. Right? And I think that's also something interesting where it's like you want people to love it so much that they can't help but talk about it. And I think that, um, that's true for a lot of companies in this room. And I think that's like something uh, brand new in crypto we haven't seen. I mean, you don't really talk about um, 
like people don't really talk about protocols to the same extent as they do things in the physical world, and I think that's something we're very excited about for the next iteration and decade of crypto. I talk about wireless at parties. Great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate the time here and really appreciate all the insight.